Okay, I think we are pretty much ready to start then. Um, so welcome everybody to the London School of Economics and Political Science for this online event, A Beginner's Guide to Wild Animal Suffering. Uh, it's an, in collaboration with the LSE SU Animal Society, a student group promoting non-human animal welfare. So my name is Dr. Ella Whiteley, and I'm a fellow in the Department of Philosophy, Logic and Scientific Method here at the LSE. And I am very, very pleased to be able to welcome Professor Oscar Orta to this event tonight. So Oscar Orta is in, a professor in the Department of Philosophy and Anthropology at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And alongside his work in moral philosophy, in which he's focused primarily on the question of who should be morally taken into account, with a special emphasis on the moral consideration of non-human animals, Oscar has also been involved in activism. So as you've seen, hopefully from his mug, he is one of the founders of Animal Ethics, which is an international animal advocacy organization with a focus on wild animal suffering. So indeed, that is what we're going to be turning to tonight. So despite this maybe almost Disney cartoon image that you might have of animals in the wild, of you know animals living in these idyllic conditions of freedom, able to express their natural instincts and capacities, the evidence suggests that there's an abundance of threats that wild animals face from everything like hunger and thirst to disease and injury and extreme climate and weather events. And well, all I'll say is if you've not heard about how parasitic wasps lay their eggs in caterpillars, then do or rather definitely do not Google that. Uh, but on a more serious note, the bottom line is that this all creates a great quantity of real suffering in amongst wild animals. So what, if anything, we can and ought to do about this suffering is something that Oscar Orta has written and talked about, and we have the pleasure of hearing directly from him tonight. Now, for those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for tonight's event is hashtag uh, LSE Oscar Orta. And this online event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available via the Animal Society YouTube um, channel, as well as the LSE Philosophy YouTube channel, uh, subject to no gremlins and technical difficulties and all that. So for the next 30 minutes, you're going to be hearing from Oscar. Uh, importantly, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to Oscar too. We're leaving around 20 minutes for this towards the end of the event. Um, but to submit those questions, what you need to do is use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, LSE student Nicholas File, who has done an awful lot setting up this event, uh, he's going to be on hand to select some of these questions and we'll try, of course, to get through as many as we possibly can. Uh, and as you should see in the Q&A box, please do let us know your name and affiliation when you write your question. We're particularly keen to hear from our students, you know, alumni and incoming students. So, yeah, do let us know those details if you can. Without further ado, though, a big, big welcome to Oscar and I will hand things over to you. Well, thank you very much. Really, I, I really appreciate it. Um, if if you can allow me just to share um, my screen, I will I will use a, a PowerPoint presentation. So so yeah, thank you very much again um, to yeah thanks everyone who's watching this and also thank you for organizing this event. Thank you Ella for chairing me and and thanks Nicholas for yeah all the work you've done. You've been amazing in getting this organized. So um, in my presentation today, I'm going to speak about uh, three very simple things. One is how we are already helping animals in need of aid in the wild. Then I'll speak about why this uh, really matters. And third, this may be the most interesting part, uh, at least for you, for those of you who are already interested in this issue. What are the ways to do progress, to make progress in this area and to improve the current situation? So um, before I start, there is this resource that I would like to um, mention here. This is a um, YouTube uh, channel which contains a lot of videos about this issue of wild animal suffering. Actually, they are part of an online video course that you can 
you can uh, take well actually it's just about watching the the text and reading the watching the, the videos and reading the text about this and i think uh, you can find there much more information in addition to the one that i will provide you here and there is also this companion ebook that can help you yet yeah, to learn a bit more about that so having said this, let's start first with the ways in which uh, humans help animals already. There are many different uh, manners in which this happens. So every now and then you can see in the media photos or pieces about uh, particular cases where individuals acting alone or with the support of some organization or body help animals in many different situations. Sometimes this happens in the case of um, natural disasters. Um, this, for instance, this picture is from Bangladesh. Um, then there are other cases, like for instance, when animals like, like um, deer, or maybe we should say deers because they are not an uncountable mass, or moose are, or elk, they are helped when they are trapped in uh, frozen lakes and would otherwise uh, starve to death or, or die because of the cold. And um, this again, another example of the same thing. Also, we are all familiar with cases where um, marine mammals get stranded on beaches and people uh, try to help them and, and often they succeed in rescuing at least some of these animals. And then um, other cases involve, for instance, rescuing animals that are trapped in mud ponds, for instance, like here or in other ways. Uh, one example that I would like to mention is this of Jane Goodall, whom I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you all know. And as you'll recall, um, uh, during last century, she was uh, studying uh, communities of chimpanzees in Africa. And there is this interesting thing in that uh, she learned there that many of these animals were dying because um, they were unable to feed because of, um, of a polio epidemic that they were suffering. And the way uh, in which uh, she and her team acted was in, they provided them uh, food with, which included the vaccine against this condition. Uh, and in this way, uh, they saved the lives of many of these animals. Other um, efforts include more significant, um, yeah, more significant efforts like um, rescue centers, for instance, for orphan animals or for sick animals, injured animals. There are many different uh, examples of this all around the world. And we are also familiar probably with um, examples of the kind maybe in our own country or not far from where we are. And uh, in other cases, um, there are projects that consist in uh, helping animals when they suffer from a particularly dire situation, for instance, when they lack uh, food. In cases like when uh, there are extreme um, weather events, for instance, in particularly harsh winters. This is an example that is actually very close from where I am in northern Spain. This was a particularly harsh uh, winter, so a team of uh, uh, veterinary um, scientists and other people went to certain areas to distribute food, targeting uh, certain animals. And the same happens uh, when, for instance, um, the weather is too dry, so animals are dying, be yeah, again, for lack of food. And finally, um, one type of intervention that I think is uh, particularly interesting is that of vaccinating vaccination against uh, certain diseases that wild animals suffer. So in this case, you can see these pictures paper about um, yeah, wild animal vaccination against tuberculosis. This is against uh, swine fever. And, and this one is against uh, vaccination against rabies. And it's interesting if you can, if, if you look at the top of the, of the page, you see there that the date is, is pretty old. It's, it's, uh, it's in, in the 80s that this work was done. So this shows that uh, this type of work has been going on for several decades already. And while these efforts are carried out mostly to help humans, because we don't want them to pass these diseases to, to us, this shows that it's possible actually to implement these measures in ways that actually help the animals themselves. So um, again, uh, a similar paper on helping wild animals against rabies. And the, the way in which this is done um, is very interesting. So what, what happens is that 
um, there are different types of tastes, tastes and smells that attract animals. So they prepare these types of baits or biscuits in which they put the vaccine, and then they distribute it. For instance, with they distribute these these baits with um, drones or like here with helicopters. And in this way, these diseases have been eradicated from from many different areas in Europe, in North America. So um, we can see that there are different ways in which animals are helped. So this is not just a hypothetical issue. We are talking about something that has been going on for, for a long time already. So uh, the question now is, why is this important? So many people have this idyllic view of nature. So they think that animals in the wild live like in yeah, Disney films. Maybe they think that they are all happy together and... Uh, yeah, at nine o'clock, they all get together and sing songs and stuff like that. But in fact, what happens is that the lives of animals, unfortunately, are mm, yeah not that nice. Many of them die or suffer very significantly, uh, for instance, due to weather conditions and um, due to extreme weather events, also lack of food, disease, uh, parasitism, and also in forest fires and Often they may suffer some injury, for instance, due to some accident. And an injury like this one can mean um, that the animal will die because they, will, they may get infections and, you know, they can't get access to antibiotics. So there are a number of reasons why animals uh, suffer very significantly in the wild. And, um, yeah, they are just as painful as uh, we can think they would be for us if we were in their place. So for instance, when, when there is bad weather, like, yeah, I don't know how, it's, how the weather has been in London for the last month, but here where I am, I mean, it's been rain for almost a month. Uh, I mean, no stop rain. So animals in those situations, they suffer just as we would be suffering if we were out there in the cold in the rain. And diseases like this one, you can see in the picture, you can imagine how painful this is. So it's not that they are superheroes, heroes, the animals there, and they don't suffer. And there is one reason also that can um, sort of illuminate the extent to which suffering uh, prevails uh, in the wild. And it's this. Um, we can sort of use um, the amount of death that is in, uh, out there in the wild, especially when it's age-specific mortality as a proxy of the suffering they, they undergo. So we can consider that premature death is harmful for animals, but also when they die, uh, if they are very young, we can also expect that it's very likely that in their lives, there is possibly more suffering than well-being because their deaths are painful often. I mean, if you die because you have no food, or because a disease uh, is killing you, that's gonna be painful. And because they die when they are very uh, young, they, um, they don't have time enough to have the positive experiences that could somehow compensate for this. And what happens is that for most animals in the wild, for the majority of animals actually, um, um, the prevalent reproductive strategies consist in bringing into, into existence huge numbers of offspring, of which only on average one per parent will survive. So we can see here this in this picture, but this happens also among many, many mammals um, and also other animals, again, reproduced by laying maybe hundreds, thousands, or maybe millions of eggs. Uh, you can see there, um, there are tiny fishlings uh, that the uh, tiny fishes that have just come into existence. And what may happen is that, for instance, um, they may come into existence and suppose that an animal will lay their eggs in, say, a pond. And they, afterwards, then uh, dry weather comes and the pond dries and all these animals will die there uh, painfully. We may think, well, maybe because they are so young, they are not sentient yet, but there are reasons to consider that these animals are already sentient when they come into existence, which means that suffering really is very significant in, in, in the wild. So having said this, what are the ways in which we can improve the current situation? What, what we can do to help more that we are already helping animals? Well, it says that the most important thing is for people 
to um, become aware that we can make a difference uh, here, that this is an issue that deserves our attention. So, um, for instance, ways in which we can make progress, ways in which we can create more awareness include, first, supporting feasible ways of helping animals. In this way, we are not just helping them already, but also we are showing people that, yeah, it's possible to continue to do this. It's possible to increase our efforts to help them. Then we can, of course, spread the idea that animals matter, that uh, speciesism, which is discrimination against those, those who don't belong to a certain species, is not an acceptable position, that we should take them into account, non-human animals. Of course, spread also concern for wild animal suffering in particular, not just for animals uh, in general. And then it's very important to risk interest in this issue among life scientists, because they are the ones who can um, do more work on this and develop further ways in which we can learn more about the ways in which we can aid wild animals. So uh, due to this, it's been suggested that um, research, actually cross-disciplinary research on this issue could incorporate knowledge that is already available in, for instance, the, the, the science of ecology and animal welfare science. This term, welfare, welfare biology, has been proposed for this study that could assess the positive and negative well-being of animals in the wild in ways that could inform uh, policies and efforts and projects to help them. And um, we may think that this is something very new and that possibly people may not um, accept this or may be reluctant to be involved in this. But at, uh, at the organization, at the charity I work uh, with, which is uh, Animal Ethics, um, we carried out um, a couple of years ago um, a survey among life scientists and, and also among students to see uh, whether they supported uh, um, you know, research in different ways of helping wild animals. And you can see there uh, the results. You can see that, uh, for instance, in the case of vaccination, a significant um, amount of them uh, supported them. And in the case of helping animals in urban environments, also a great number of them supported them. And also in the case of helping animals that are victims of weather events, a large number of people in this field uh, supported this. And they not just uh, express the support themselves for this, but also they uh, considered, most of them considered that these projects would be supported in their departments. So yeah, we have no reason not to be optimistic about uh, the ways in which we can develop this. And then there are other projects in addition to these three that I mentioned that uh, can also be supported and where people have been working already. One would be, for instance, um, contraception that can uh, reduce uh, animals when, for instance, re reduce population of populations of animals when they are th when things are happening like lack of food or when they are undergoing uh, certain epidemics in ways that can help us to provide them help without their populations afterwards increasing in ways that could be problematic for them uh, that could lead, for instance, for future generations suffering to a greater, uh, greater extent. And um, there are also uh, seeing these uh, different ways that um, students can actually start doing now. So for instance, they could do things like um, getting involved in especially important research. For instance, they could consider issues that are relevant for welfare biology, for wild animal suffering or wild animal welfare in say their dissertations. So if uh, people who are working in biology and ecology could do literature reviews of factors affecting the well-being of animals, I mean, not just conservation issues because that, uh, that doesn't have to do really with the well-being of animals. And they could also research the potential effects of different forms of helping wild animals in case they may have, you know, um, possible unforeseen effects that we want to avoid. As for veterinary science students, they could uh, research um, on the assessments of the welfare of animals not living in captivity. They could also do work on wild animal contraception and wild animal vaccination. Then people working on environmental studies 
could work uh, a bit more on understanding the field, carrying out literature reviews of relevant issues for this. Social scientists could, um, you know, work on assessing the attitudes toward helping animals in different um, groups of people. So, for instance, among uh, yeah scholars or among the general public, or maybe among, say, animal advocates or other groups. And then people working on law, politics, and philosophy could um, do research on how to promote changes in policy and legislation that can help these animals. And of course, on, on the case, uh, on the ethical case for uh, helping wild animals. So yeah, um, that's pretty much what I wanted to say about, about this. Of course, people who, like you are uh, working on campus could do other things like, for instance, organizing events like this one, talking with students and organizing seminars where researchers, scholars could be, you know, um, addressed. Maybe a reading group is something that, that you can also do. And um, yeah, again, uh, let me repeat that if you want to learn more about this, you can take a look at this video course. And uh, I think uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will be, yeah, uh, delighted to, to see what you have to mention about this and what questions you have.